Welcome to the third video of endotracheal intubation video series. Let's agree on two important points. First, that inserting a tube down somebody's throat is a very uncomfortable and painful procedure. And second, that endotracheal intubation has been done as quickly as possible. So it's very important that the patient is comfortable during the procedure and it's very important that we have full control of the patient airway. So how do we achieve this? Simply by sedating the patient patient and then paralyzing the patient if needed. This is simply what we call RSI, rapid sequence intubation or induction. Simply a procedure we do to intubate patients who are unstable as quickly as possible and simply is just have full control of their airways while making sure they are comfortable during the procedure. In today's video, we're going to talk about RSI. We're going to talk about the commonly used sedative agents, commonly used paralytics agents. How and when to use them? I will provide you with some clinical scenarios during this video. So first, make sure you watch the video series in order as the information in each video build on the information on the previous video. And I'll put a link for the full video series in the description so you can watch it from the beginning. And also don't forget to tap that subscribe button if you have not subscribed to our channel. And don't forget to tap that notification bell so you get to see the videos as soon as they are released. And one more request, please like and share the video if you find it useful. First, let's watch this quick video talking about the commonly used sedative agents and paralytic agents. And let's continue after watching this video. let's talk about sedative agents first as you just saw these agents or most of these agents need 30 to 60 seconds to kick in so it's very important that you allow this time the patient needs to be completely out before you're trying laryngoscopy and trying to insert the ET tube never push the paralytic agents before sedative agents 
just imagine yourself paralyzed you cannot move and you're still awake it's very scary experience so you always push sedatives first followed by paralytics remember that very well remember that all these agents are weight based so you need to know the patient weight before you start the procedure you need also to pick your sedative agents and paralytic agents decide your dose based on the patient weight and tell your nurse about so these agents are ready to push when you're doing the procedure don't wait until you're having the laryngoscope with your in your hand and then you think about what medication and what dose hypotension can develop when we push these sedative agents and regardless of the agent most of these patients are already volume depleted and now we sedate them they can get hypotension the first line treatment for hypotension is of course IV fluid. Give a liter or two of isotonic solution before you're thinking about vasopressor or any other option. The only contraindication to push the fluids and it's a relative contraindication is pulmonary edema. The patient is already intubated so you need to look at your risk and benefits at that point. Now let's talk about the specific agents and let's start by talking about etomidate. Etomidate is my favorite. It's first line in all conditions literally there is no condition that you could say that we cannot use etomidate it doesn't affect your blood pressure it is safe to use in seizures it can cause this my brief jerks or myoclonus i've never seen them but they usually they are very brief you don't need to treat them adrenal suppression is very rare so if you get somebody who gets hypotension after etomidate treat them with fluid first a liter or two or more sometimes depends on their volume depletion before you thinking of giving a dose of hydrocortisone for example etomidate is the first agent i think of whenever i decide to intubate patients and in my clinical practice i always pick etomidate as a first line and i don't remember when was the last time i used any other agents ketamine now ketamine they say it release catecholamines and so that means increase the sympathetic tone and that means may induce you know things that come with increased sympathetic drive the increased heart rate increased blood pressure bronchodilation it's very important to remember that ketamine can cause hypotension especially in the catecholamine depleted patient like somebody with hyperthyroid stat status for example so ketamine that doesn't cause hypotension is not true anymore Ketamine can be safe in cases with increased intracranial pressure. There was a debate about it, but really I don't see any problem using that with head trauma, for example. But remember, if I have an option to use a safer agent, etomidate, why do I use ketamine with still this theoretical risk of increasing intracranial pressure? And because ketamine increase the catechol or release catecholamines, that that's theoretical bronchodilation that effect. Um, so again, in severe asthmatic exacerbation or COPD exacerbation, I still use etomidate. But using ketamine can be also a good choice with this theoretical bronchodilation effect. Propofol. The problem with propofol in a lot of cases, whenever I see propofol, it causes hypotension. Now remember, these patients that we are intubating most of them unstable most of them volume depleted most of them when we give propofol the blood pressure the next thing you see their blood pressure is the nurse telling you oh it's 60 over 40 or 70 over 40 so whenever you're thinking about giving propofol make sure you resuscitate the patient with fluid actually in all of them if there is volume depletion because remember you intubate these patient the next thing they are on mechanical ventilation with that positive pressure ventilation decrease venous return then you it's perfect setup for severe hypotension from volume depletion so remember volume resuscitation is very important now propofol can be really helpful when you have a status epilepticus or you have an, a head trauma but again etomidate still first line to me in these cases but you want to use propofol go for it midazolam midazolam the main issue with midazolam it's underdosed because we use it in conscious sedation we use like four five six milligram doses but in induction in rsi midazolam you're talking about 0.2 milligram per kg so a 70 kilogram patients needs 14 milligram of midazolam or what we call verset the brand name so just imagine giving pushing 14 milligram of uh, midazolam that's the right dose but people not used to use a large dose all at once 
So that's why it's frequently underdosed. So remember, midazolam at this dose can cause absolutely hypotension in volume depleted patient. And the answer again is what volume resuscitation as we just explained. Now midazolam is a benzodiazepine and it's the only benzodiazepine I would use it in RSI. So it can be perfect choice for patients with active seizure or status epilepticus. If you ask me, I would still use etomidate as first line agent. But you wanna use midazolam in such case? Absolutely. Now let's give you some clinical scenarios and which agent we should use. First of all, remember, etomidate, we agree that you can use it first line in all cases, no problems, okay? Now, case number one, you're having a patient with a status epilepticus. So which agent we should use? As I said, etomidate should be first line. Propofol is a good choice. Midazolam is a good choice as well. I would try to avoid ketamine in such case because again, it causes more kind of a stimulation, cerebral stimulation. Again, whenever there is something debatable, why to go for it? Just use the agents that everybody agree that they are good in such choice. So, etomidate, midazolam, and propofol. Remember, etomidate effect on blood pressure is nothing. It doesn't cause hypotension while midazolam and propofol, they cause hypotension. A patient with acute coronary syndrome, etomidate is great. You wanna use midazolam, okay. Propofol, okay. Ketamine, also there's the theoretical risk that it release catecholamine cause more tachycardia, so more oxygen demands. So again, I don't think it's a disaster if you use ketamine if that's the only agent you have. But why to use it if you have other options, right? A patient with head trauma in the emergency room need to be intubated. So there is this risk of increased intracranial pressure. Again, etomidate, I would use it first line. Propofol is good choice. Midazolam, also good choice. Again, there is this theoretical risk that ketamine can increase or worsen intracranial pressure. But again, it's theoretical. If the ketamine is the only agent you have used, it, don't worry about it. But if you have these alternatives, why to use ketamine then? A patient with severe COPD exacerbation. To me, again, I would use etomidate first. Etomidate would be good. Now, the theoretical bronchodilation effect of ketamine because it releases catecholamines makes sense that I can use uh, I can use ketamine as well. So this is a case where ketamine can be really a good choice. But again, if you use etomidate first, that, that's great. That's not a problem at all. Now, let's move and talk about the commonly used paralytic agents. Now, again, I'm going to repeat this. Never push the paralytic agents before pushing sedative agents. The worst experience in your life would be being awake and paralyzed. Remember that very well. Second, once patient is paralyzed, we have full control on him. The patient has to be intubated as quickly as possible. You better be confident that you will be able to intubate the patient as quickly as possible when you're pushing that paralytics. If you are, let's say, junior, in intubation experience just a beginner in doing intubation make sure you have an experience back up before you push that paralytics if difficult airways or difficult intubation anticipated what i would do before i push that paralytics i would take what i call a semi awake look i can push the sedation and take a look before i push the paralytics and see if i can easily find the epiglottis and the vocal cords then at that point i can push the paralytics and insert the ET tube. If difficult intubation anticipated, it's better to have an experience backup before you push that paralytics. The last thing you need to have somebody who's paralyzed and you are unable to intubate and the patient start desaturating, you are unable to ventilate with the ambu back. Paralytics agents in general, they need 45 to 60 seconds to kick in. Succinylcholine usually first line to use because the duration of action up to 15, 20 minutes, while recuronium can last up to 45 minutes. Succinylcholine is quick onset, quick offset. That's why we like it. The problem now, as you know, with succinylcholine, that you are intubating somebody emergently or urgently. So if you are not sure if the patient has any contraindication to succinylcholine, you better use rocuronium. I like rocuronium. I use it a lot. That saved me the headache of thinking of contraindications of succinylcholine. I've never used vicuronium because you need that priming dose like three minutes before giving the second dose. And that's impractical in real life experience. So it's very important to be aware of the contraindication of succinylcholine. 
And if you at any point confuse, you cannot think, just pick rocuronium and get that headache out of your head. It is safe to use neuromuscular blocking agents, paralytics, in myasthenia graphs. You just need to adjust the dose. With succinyl choline, you need to increase the dose to 2 mg per kg. In rocuronium, you need to drop the dose to 0.6 mg per kg. So with succinyl choline, you increase the dose. With rocuronium, you decrease the dose. Now let's finish by talking about the RSI again. We just discussed RSI, right? Rapid sequence intubation. It's mainly used for unstable patient. Patient needs to be intubated as quickly as possible and there is a risk, high risk of aspiration. Somebody just went into severe pulmonary edema or somebody just had a stroke, right? And unable to protect airways. So it's usually emergent slash urgent situations. So you need a full control of the patient airways and you need to make sure the patient is sedated. So that's what they call rapid sequence intubation. Sequence because it has to go in sequence. Sedate first, Paralyze second. Remember that very well. And remember that when you commit to paralyzing the patient, you need to intubate them as quickly as possible. Next video, we'll talk about the endotracheal intubation procedure itself. Remember to tap that subscribe button if you have not done so, and tap that notification bell. And remember to like and share our videos if you find it useful.